Hello everyone, this is Kuhiri Roy. At the outset, I would like to thank St. Mother Teresa Engineering College for giving me the opportunity to speak today for this webinar. Today, I would like to talk about the recent trends in computer vision for self-driving cars. And along with that, I will also talk about few challenges and scope that is existing currently in this area so that we get an idea of the research perspective of self-driving cars. So with that, let's get started. So in the next one hour, I will be talking about the recent trends in computer vision for self-driving cars. Along with that, I will also talk about the challenges that we still have in this area so that we get a research perspective for this area. So brief outline of the topics which I have selected for today's webinar would be the significance of computer vision and the different tasks that we can accomplish using computer vision methods. Next, I will move on to the challenges and few scope of the self-driving cars. This will be followed by the levels of autonomous driving, the level which we are currently in and the level that we are desiring to reach. This will be followed by the discussion of the methods and the challenges in development of the components of the software stack of self-driving cars. So to start with, let me talk about the term computer vision. If we break this word into two parts, we have computer and we have vision. Let me talk about the vision first. From human perspective, when we say vision, we mean that the human is expected to see, to analyze and to get out a meaningful interpretation from that image. Because we all know that a picture is worth a thousand words. Now, in order to extract those thousand words from that image, we need to see, we need to analyze so that we can depict the interpretation from that image. Now I will talk about few basic tasks that we can accomplish using computer vision methods. So the first example is of semantic segmentation. As you see in this image, every pixel is labeled as either grass or cat or tree or sky. So this is what we try to accomplish using semantic segmentation. Next we will move on to classification and localization. Next, I will talk about classification and localization. If an image of a cat has been given to a human being, the human being can very quickly identify that this image belongs to a cat. But sometimes only classification is not enough. We might need to find out the exact location where the cat is located in an image. That's when we go for localization. Next, I will talk about object detection. If there are multiple objects present in an image and we want each of them to get detected, then we go for object detection. And the output which we will get will be bounding boxes around each and every detected objects in the image. Next comes the instance segmentation. This can be considered as a slight extension to semantic segmentation. So after labeling each pixel as to the object that it belongs to, we can also group them so that we come to know the number of instance of a particular class that is present within an object. So in an image, if we want to know how many dogs are there or how many cats are there, we can easily identify from that grouped pixel that how many dogs are there and how many cats are there. This is what the goal of instant segmentation is. So with this, I'll move on to my next slide, which is the self-driving cars. Where are we right now? So the first image which you see here is a picture of one of the first driverless cars that was tested by Carl Benz, but it crashed into the wall. From that time onwards, the automobile industry have been trying very hard to make the car more smarter, more reliable. Now, what do I mean by smartness and being more reliable? By making the car more smarter, we will make the car aware of its surroundings, we will make the car aware of the obstacles that it might get into crash to. 
so that it can make its own decision to have a safe collision free drive. By reliable we mean that a driver can comfortably sit inside the car and the car will, will take the driver to the destination safely. Next I will talk about the levels of autonomous driving. So, different car companies they have different expectations from the levels that they themselves decide upon but in general we have five levels of autonomous driving. Level 1 of autonomous driving. In level 1 autonomous driving the car is expected to give basic driver assistance. By means of basic driver assistance, I mean the car should give a warning of the collision that it might happen with respect to a nearby vehicle or a nearby pedestrian. Next, I will come to level 2 where partial automation is possible, where in scenarios of such upcoming collision, the car can also take charge of the steering. Next, I will talk about level 3 that is the high automated driving. This is a level which almost many car companies has almost achieved and it is in the testing phase. In highly automated driving the car has been made to be smart enough to perceive the environment around it so that it can take its own decision to have a smooth and collision free drive. Next comes the level 4 or the fully automated driving. There is a difference between level 3 and level 4. In level 4 when the car is giving the warning, the driver might ignore the warning or the driver might not listen to it. Even in that case the car can go to a safe mode. And finally comes the most desired level 5 or the fully automation where there should be no driver interaction. Next I will talk about the various components of self-driving cars. So today's webinar I will talk about mainly sensor fusion, computer vision, localization and path planning. Now I will give a brief outline of all these components. Sensor fusion this plays a very crucial role in the development of software stacks for self-driving cars. By means of sensor fusion, we tend to get an information about the environment around us. I mean that we need to get information about the various obstacles or whether be it static or dynamic around us by means of the sensors that is mounted on the car. The car here that is our car, the self-driving car is also referred to as ego vehicle. Next comes the computer vision. Perceiving the information about the world around us is alone not enough. We need to properly analyze to find out which are the obstacles that might be a hurdle for us to understand which of them are relevant for us to get into a decision making for path planning. Once this is done, we should also find out precisely where the eco vehicle is located. That can be accomplished using localization part. With all this input, the eco vehicle is now ready for the path planning that is to make the decision for its own trajectory. With this, let us move on to the next slide, the sensor fusion which is the first crucial part of the development of software stack for self-driving cars. Today's uh, autonomous cars, they are equipped with lot of sensors mounted at different positions. Of course, there are reasons for it. So let us see the different sensors that is mounted on the car today. The video camera that it can be placed in the front of the car or the rear of the car. Then we have the laser sensor which is mounted at the top of the car. We also have the radar sensors and the ultrasonic sensors. Today here I will be talking about the pros and cons of three very important sensors that most of the automobile industry uses. The camera, the radar and the lidar. 
camera as we know it is limited to certain range beyond that range the camera cannot view any targets in order to overcome this range problem we can make use of the radar and lidar these two sensors work almost towards the same goal but with a different technology lidar works with light detection and ranging whereas radar works with the radio waves now even between this radar and lidar they have their own advantages and disadvantages lidar which is mounted at the top of the car it keeps rotating so that we get an idea of the 360 degree view of the environment around the ego vehicle for that the lidar keeps emitting light signals of around more than 1 lakh per second with that we can get an idea of the 3d shape and also the pose of a particular obstacle whether it be it pedestrian or a car but on the other hand it does not give us much information about the appearances of the car like the color so for that again camera is useful on the other hand the lidar often tends to lose the sight of the target on certain curve and that's when radar will come into picture for big trucks for which we need to get the sight of targets till quite a far distance radar is very useful in that not only that radar also gives us information about the velocity so for that radar is useful and uh, there is one more aspect the weather aspect we all know that we need to have lot of processing done to be done if we are going to use the camera images in scenarios like fog or in darkness in that radar will be useful so let's talk about what output we are expecting from this perception component we are expecting the precise 3d positions of all the objects the velocities the acceleration and also the object classes or whether it is a bicycle or whether it is a pedestrian or whether it is a car and also the static components like traffic lights or other signs on the road with that i'll move on to my next slide which talks about certain method and the challenges in the sensor fusion part i'll explain a bit about the first picture here here as you see we have a picture of a 2d image with a car detected with a red color bounding box around it and we also have the corresponding depth image which gives us information about the depth of certain obstacle or object in an image with the information we can have this particular area of the car and we can map it to the point cloud before talking about point cloud i'll say what it is point cloud is nothing but the information about different points of the environment the information of which we are getting using the lidar since we get the information of so many points it is named as point cloud so let's come back to the mapping between the camera and the point cloud image so once we have identified the 2d region of the car we can map that particular region to the 3d box that of to find out the location the pose and the shape of the car from the lidar point cloud image so this is just an underlying principle of how we can fuse the data from the 2d image from the camera as also from the point cloud image that we get from the lidar this is very important to do this mapping that is because just imagine if we are going to process the information of the 1 lakh data that we are getting from the point cloud it is very time consuming so we need to compare and filter out the obstacle which is actually relevant for us next i'll talk about the algorithm that we mostly use for the sensor fusion part that is called kalman filter 
Kalman filter definitely has its own pretty mathematics inside it, but the underlying principle is very simple. It works on the basis of the prediction and the updating of the measurement. So, what do we predict and what do we update? Now, let us start with the initial phase of this Kalman filter. We have the initial measurements that we obtain from different sensors. Using those initial measurement, we predict the state of those objects in the next time instant. Also, in the next time instant, we will be getting new values or new measurement. Using those new measurement, we will update our predicted state, the predicted measurements that we had for the object. So, it keeps on going in a loop for prediction and updation. So, that is what the two step estimation problem is uh, being solved using Kalman filter. Now, uh, what are the challenges that we can face in the sense of fusion part? One challenge I have already mentioned that is the increased processing time of the scan points. So, that is why we need to filter out the relevant portions. Apart from that, we also expect high precision and high recall in the sensor fusion part. Now, what does that mean? In high precision, we expect that there should be no false detection. For example, if there are two cars in front of us and one car is getting detected as a static stone or some signs on the road, then that is not what we are expecting. So, that is what high precision means. And next comes a high recall that is even more crucial that is because if we are having two cars on the road and if one car is not at all getting detected then the car will might definitely go and crash into that undetected car right. So, getting high recall is even more crucial. So, let us see how we can achieve this high precision and high recall. So, broadly speaking, there can be two approaches for sensor fusion. One is the late fusion, the other one is the early fusion. So, what is that? In late fusion, we have the detections coming up first. We have all the detection coming up from the camera and we have all the detection that is coming up from the lidar so that we do not miss any detections. So, obviously, late fusion leads to high recall. Next, I will come to early fusion. In early fusion, we do the fusion with respect to the raw outputs that we are getting from the camera and the lidar. So, this early fusion will lead to high precision. We might miss some uh, obstacles, we might miss some detections but we would not get any false detection. So, that is what high precision is and that can be achieved using early fusion. Now, both are having their own pros and cons. So, when we are designing the sensor fusion component, we should have a trade off between these two and we all should also be careful about the efficiency of the output that we are getting from the sensor fusion part. If you want to get an idea of how the sensor fusion works, you can make use of different data sets which provide us the point cloud and the camera data as well and you can try out different mapping approaches between the 3D data and the 2D data. So, we can get an idea of how we can fuse the camera data and the lidar data and this can be a good project for the final year also. So, you can think about it. Okay, next I will move on to my next component that is the environmental perception. So far, I have been talking about how we can obtain the information or how we can combine the relevant information from different sensors that is mounted on the car. Now, I will talk about the analysis part. Like after we are getting the information, how we can exactly analyze which is relevant for us and which is an obstacle that might cause hurdles for us for driving. So, few examples are the lane detection, 
the curvature and the center alignment. Next we have the traffic sign detection and recognition. This is also quite important. In this traffic sign detection we have actually two phase. We need to detect if there is a traffic sign in front of us. Along with that we also need to recognize what the traffic sign says. Like in this example image I have shown a traffic sign which says 50 km per hour. Such traffic signs we usually see on the start of a city or the end exit of a city. So when the car sees it, the car should know that it should not exceed beyond 50 km per hour till some time till we do not see the end of this uh, road. So next I will talk about the different uh, detections of VRU. So VRU stands for vulnerable road users. That basically refers to the pedestrian detection, the vehicle detection, the dynamic portions. Now usually we do the object detection for this and the output which we get is a bounding box around the detected objects or the detected pedestrian the detected vehicles. A final level of detection or analysis is sometimes required. So in that case we go for semantic segmentation which you have already discussed in the first few slides that is we label each pixel as to whether it belongs to a particular class of object or not whether it belongs to a car or it belongs to a traffic light or it belongs to a pedestrian. So how can we achieve this three things and what are the key tasks and how can we achieve this? There are three main tasks that we try to accomplish in this environmental perception part that is the detection, the tracking and the semantic segmentation. Detection is nothing but detecting the objects around us. Detection alone is not enough. We also need to classify what those objects are, whether it is a car or whether it is a pedestrian. So for this, we need to have two different neural networks, one for detection and one for classification. Mostly we make use of CNN or the convolutional neural network. It is a part of deep learning basically. So very briefly, I will tell you about CNN which is the convolutional neural network. Unlike the traditional machine learning algorithms, the efficiency or the performance of a neural network has been found to increase when it is scaled. So the scaled form of neural network has led to the deep learning or the convolutional neural network. Of course, there are a lot of variants of convolutional neural networks. But we can make use of the uh, different networks like uh, VGG net, the Google net. These are just few examples of CNN that is mostly being used currently. And for detection, we make use of RCNN that is the region CNN. And also the different variants of RCNN which is the fast RCNN and the faster RCNN. Next, I will talk about tracking which is also an important task of environmental perception. So why do we need tracking when we are already doing detection? We are already detecting the objects in each frame. Then why do we need to do tracking also? What will we gain out of it? So tracking in a way is much efficient when the detection fails. For example, if in a certain video frame a particular car is occluded by a big truck then a tracking can help because tracking tends to track the objects that has been detected in the previous frame. Since position and velocity of the cars does not change much across the video frames this can be of useful information in order to track the cars. Next comes the semantic segmentation which we can make use of in order to label 
each and every pixel to a particular class or object with be it a car or a tree or the sky. So for this we make use of another variant of RCNN that is the region CNN which is called mask RCNN. So what this mark, uh, mask RCNN does is, I will go to the previous slide. As we see that we can detect a pedestrian when we can have a bounding box around it. But not all the pixels within this bounding box belong to a pedestrian. So we can label the pixel whether it belongs to or whether it does not belong to the object class that it is claiming to have. So I will talk about few challenges that we can face during this detection and the classification. Number one shadows from cars and trees here yeah, that the shadows itself might get detected as an object. Then the variation of light conditions that also might affect the tracking as well as the detection and classification. Next the worn out lane markings sometimes the center of the lane or even the boundary of the lane might be worn out. So we do not know whether there is actually a lane or not. Then the directional arrows or different other markings that also need to get detected to have a clear vision of what the car needs to uh, do or the how the car needs to drive. Next different warning text like work is going on or there is some uh, highway construction going on like that. Then the zebra crossings. Next there are some small objects that might not get detected like for LIDAR as I said if you are having the point cloud and if there are two small objects the LIDAR might not identify that they are two different objects that is lying side by side. And when I was uh, working with LIDAR taking capturing images using that there are points which was not even getting detected as being lying on the ground. So a very useful use case of working with the LIDAR can be to classify whether it is a ground point or a non ground point. So for final year project if you want to get used to the different concepts or the methods for the environmental perception you can do in two ways you can take 2D images from camera and you can uh, apply various detection and classification algorithm on that. On the other hand you can also buy your own LIDAR and you can get some point cloud and you can try to do a mapping between different regions from the point cloud to the camera. Okay. So let us move on to the next portion that is the localization. So once we are aware of our environment now it is time to know where exactly we are located in the world. All know of something called GPS. GPS also gives an information about our location in the world but the measurement might have certain errors. So when it comes to self driving it is very important to know our own location also so that it does not turn out to be fatal. So localization can be defined as the implementation of algorithms to estimate where our vehicle is with an error of less than 10 centimeter. So we need to be really very precise. There are few sensors which can be broadly classified as either interoceptive sensors and exteroceptive sensors to give us an idea of the position measurements. Interoceptive sensors mostly gives the relative position measurement. One such way is to make use of the odometry. Odometry actually makes use of the starting position and a wheel displacement calculation. So that will estimate the position of our ego vehicle at certain time t. Apart from that there is also something called inertial measurement unit. Inertial measurement unit is used to calculate the acceleration in terms of x axis which is also called roll, the y axis which gives us information about the pitch and the z or the yaw. So 
Next, I will talk about the extraceptive sensors. Extraceptive sensors are the sensors which provide absolute position measurement and these includes camera and lasers also. The algorithm which is commonly been used for localization is particle filter. So, I will talk about the underlying principle of particle filter. I will not go into the mathematical details. So, how it works is we are given a map. So, a map or the HD map has information about different landmarks that is present. The landmarks can be uh, traffic signs or any other signs on the road. So, with this landmark information defined in a map, we can do our own localization. How? We already have a map that I have mentioned already. Apart from that, when our car is moving, even the camera can also detect those landmarks in that image. So, what it does is it matches the location of the landmarks present in the map and the landmarks that is getting detected using our camera and using those we can find out where our ego vehicle is with relative to those landmarks. So, that is how particle filter works. It makes a comparison between the observation of our sensors with the environmental map. So, what if we are not being provided with the map of the landmarks? For example, there can be cases where there is no prior information to the landmark which is present around us. So, in such scenario, how can we know our precise location or the location of the ego vehicle? That is when SLAM comes into picture. SLAM is nothing but simultaneous localization and mapping. So, what we are going to achieve with this? We are going to get the idea of the map around us and we will also find out our own precise location. So, that is what simultaneous localization and mapping is. Primarily, we will make use of the visual simultaneous localization and mapping, which in short we also call VSLAM. Now, why this visual SLAM? That is because we make use of our sensors to see and track the objects around us in order to calculate a map of the landmarks or objects around us with respect to those maps which we are seeing or we are tracking we will find out our own position relative to those landmark. So, here at this point we should be very clear that by means of VSLAM or SLAM we are not going to find out the location of the landmarks or the objects but our main goal is to find out the location of our ego vehicle with respect to those landmarks or objects which we will be visualizing with our sensors. Now, as I said using our sensors we will be seeing the world around us and we will be making use of those images data. Now, the way we will be making use of this image data can be classified as either sparse or dense or feature based or direct. Briefly, I will explain what these are. So, sparse and dense, this means that when the acquired image is being seen sparsely that we will not uh, process all the parts entire parts of the image then we call it as a sparse VSLAM. If we are processing or we are making use of the image data densely then it is called the dense VSLAM. So, apart from this we can also make use of the image data in a different way. How? We can just detect the important features in an image. The features can be of surf or sift. So, these actually determines the points in uh, the picture 
which is of high importance so that we can make use of only those features and track those features to get the relative position of our own vehicle. So that is the feature based uh, VSLAM. Next comes the direct. So I already mentioned that we need to see the object and we need to track it across different time instants in order to get our own relative position with respect to that particular object. So when we are doing this matching or tracking instead of making use of only those particular feature that I have discussed in the feature based uh, one, we can make use of the entire images and see which parts is a matching actually. So by doing this we can also make use of the image data in a much more better or in a much more vast way in order to find out our own relative position. Now I will explain about the picture which I have uh, uh, put here. Uh, here we see that there are camera at k minus 1, k and k plus 1. So this are the cameras which is placed at three different poses at three different time instant and we are basically trying to see the same point from different poses of the camera. After this we will be trying to track that particular point across the video frames across the time instant and we will be performing a triangulation method. I am not going into the details of it. We will be performing the triangulation method to perform the measurement of our own camera pose, the relative camera pose from where we have viewed that particular object point. So that is how a VSLAM actually works. So next I will talk about the prediction part. So what are we actually going to predict? A key task would be to predict the target lane for vehicles and for this the method or the algorithm that we mostly use is RNN or the recurrent neural network. In recurrent neural network we make use of the history of the information from the previous images or the video frames in order to predict the state that might be happening in the next time instant. So for predicting the target lane for vehicles we actually need two RNNs. One RNN will give the sequence of the lanes the different combinations that might be there and we also have an RNN to predict the obstacle status or the state of the obstacle at each time instant or the next time instant. Now we concatenate this two particular RNN and we find a probability of having an obstacle or an object to take a particular lane sequence. So out of all the lane sequence the one with the highest probability of the obstacle taking it will be our predicted target lane. Now predicting only the target lane for vehicles alone is not enough. A ego vehicle or a self driving car should be able to react to dynamic factors like if a pedestrian walking on the footpath is just stepping onto the road. So in such scenarios a human can quickly take a decision or a human can make out that the pedestrian has stepped onto the road so that it slows down the car. In similar uh, scenarios the car the self driving car should also be able to predict the pose of the pedestrian You understand whether the pedestrian is going to step onto the road and take necessary decisions. So how can we achieve that? For that we have to estimate the human pose. And for estimating the human pose broadly there are two approaches one is the bottom up the other one is the top down. In bottom up approaches we first find out the various parts or joints of a particular human being and then we assemble together 
and associate them with a particular human. This association is very important for the human post estimation because if there are multiple pedestrians, we need to first detect the parts of the joints and once we are joining them together, we need to associate them to which human those uh, joints belong to. There is one more approach called the top down approach. In the top down approach, there is a segmentation step or there is a detection step and that is followed by the pose estimation. So, in the top down approach, what we actually do is we first detect the region of a particular person and then on top of that, we do a pose estimation. Next, I move on to the next part, which is the path planning, which is a very important step. It is quite complex because we need to consider a lot of factors when we have to plan the path for the car, but it is not impossible right now at least. So, for achieving this path planning, the method which currently is being used is reinforcement learning. So, I will talk a brief about reinforcement learning before telling how it can be used for path planning of self-driving cars. So, how, how in reinforcement learning works is it works on the basis of the rewards. The reward which we obtain by performing an action to the environment. So, basically there are three main components in a reinforcement learning. The agent which is supposed to perform an action to the environment and on performing the action to the environment we reach a particular state from which we get certain observation and based on the observation we gain rewards. So, based on the reward the agent keeps learning. So, that is what a reinforcement learning is. Now, to give an example I will take an example of a robo. If a robo is asked to walk and pick up the pins, maybe the robo might not succeed in the first attempt. So, the robo keeps failing and the robo keeps on getting some reward. Based on the reward and the action which it performs, it will learn which action will lead to a positive reward and which action will lead to a negative reward. With this, I will come to the application of reinforcement learning for self-driving cars. Now, as I said, we need to have a record of the reward value for every single action that we are going to take. Then only the agent or a robo can learn which action will lead to positive or negative reward. Now, let us apply this reinforcement learning for self-driving car. Now, suppose we are given the source and the destination. Now, if the car is taking a wrong way or the wrong path in a particular time instant, that should actually lead to negative reward. But in the scenario of a self-driving car, we cannot have the reward for each and every single position that a car might take, then we have to have the reward value for every single point or every single coordinate point on the earth. That is definitely not possible. And apart from that, we also have to consider some other uh, factors like weather condition or whether the direction of the agent is facing to the right direction or not. So, what we can do is we can make use of machine learning to predict the rewards for every action. What I mean is instead of clearly having a record of every action and the reward for that particular action, we will make use of machine learning to predict the rewards for each action that the self-driving car may take. So, in this way we can do a exploration, also we can do a exploitation. I will explain in brief. So, let us suppose a car may take 
some 10 different paths. So, we can either explore all the 10 different paths to predict the reward and go ahead or we can do a exploitation of the so far achieved best rewarded action. So, in a way we are basically mapping the action to the reward so that we do not need to have the input of the rewards from before. Now, let us talk about few challenges that we might face in path planning. As I said reinforcement learning is depending on the rewards on based on the action that we are going to take. Now, it might happen that the action which we are going to take might not be a correct one for some scenario which the car have not even learnt before. So, for this I have taken a small example from a blog. So, in this the car is expected to drive straight. Let us suppose the car has to reach a coffee shop at the end of the road. So, the car has to drive straight. Now, if it suddenly finds some obstacle lying on the road or some big hole on the road, the car should take a slight drift to the left. But again after crossing that particular hole, the car is supposed to continue straight by drifting back to the right. Now, these are certain scenarios which the car might not have learned before. Based on what it has learned, the car is supposed to drive straight. On the other hand, once the car drifts to the left, it might happen that based on the prediction, the car continues to travel to the left. And in such scenario, the car will never reach the coffee shop that it was intending to reach. So, in many cases the reinforcement learning is not being able to converge to the main goal. In such scenario we make use of imitation learning. Imitation learning actually makes use of supervised learning by collecting such of course, scenarios like as I said that if there is an obstacle or if there is a big hole on the road or on the path that the car was intending to go, the car should be uh, efficient enough to take a proper decision when to drift and when to drift back to the actual course. So, to make use of learning in this scenario we need to collect more training samples of this of course situations that might happen. Since it makes use of a supervised learning that it has to take we sometimes refer to this type of learning as the expert um, demonstration. Okay. So, in order to deal with this drifting where there is no expert uh, decision available, we make use of the of course situation collected before and the behavior that the car should perform on such of course situation. So, this is what an imitation learning is. Now, with this I have almost reached the end of the session. So, I will again summarize few key takeaways from this session. I have discussed about the various components of the software stack of the self driving cars and I have discussed few projects that you might uh, think to take for your final year. So, out of that for sensor fusion I would suggest the mapping between the lidar data and the camera data is quite interesting. Next for the environmental perception, I would say you can make use of the lidar data as well as the camera data. With the camera data you can detect lanes or you can also find out the curvature or you can make use of different detection and classification algorithm to perform the semantic segmentation stuffs. 
Next for uh, prediction part also you can make use of RNN to predict the lane of certain cars. So with this I would say thank you all for being patient and for listening to my lecture. I hope you found it to be useful. Thank you so much.